Welcome to today's episode. I'm Hussein, and I will review ten different highlights as surfaced by Readwise from my readings. So let's get started. The first one is from Kill It With Fire, and it's a long one. If you have hundreds or even thousands of engineers contributing to the same code base, the potential for miscommunication and conflict is almost infinite. Coordinating between teams sharing ownership on the same monolith often pushes organizations back into a traditional release cycle model where one team tests and assembles a set of updates that go to production in a giant package. This slows development down, and more important, it slows down rollbacks that affect the organization's ability to respond to a failure. Uh, it's not mentioned in this um, highlight, but the author is talking about the benefits of microservices, and it's uh, uh, well, benefits is the wrong word over here. It's more about the appropriateness of microservices. So when would you use microservices when an organization has hundreds or thousands of engineers all working on different parts of code base? That is when uh, a, a, a microservices architecture would make sense. Until then, it's probably an overkill. So the point is, how do you? What are the what are the heuristics to evaluate? You know, what architecture is the right one for your application for the system that you're building? Uh, we in the Drupal community, this is kind of often talked about. Uh, a few years back, when Decouple was all the all the rage, you know, it was it was the hype. It was like okay, every site will become Decouple now going onwards, and uh, very quickly the community learned, all the the industry learned that that's not helping anybody. Um, it makes sense to Decouple when the teams need to be Decoupled. So it's really the teams that drive the change, and that's Conway's law in action that uh, the architecture of the software depends on the architecture of the organization or mirrors the architecture uh, design of the organization. Uh, yeah, I guess that's that's pretty much it. Let's move on. Again, kill it with fire. Well-integrated, high-functioning software that is easy to understand usually blends in. Simple solutions do not do much to enhance one's personal brand. They're really worth talking about. Therefore, when an organization provides no pathway to promotion for software engineers, they incentivize to make technical decisions that emphasize their individual contribution over integrating well into an existing system. This is very similar to resume-driven development, you know, where engineers, uh, in order to build the resumes, they, they build systems so that the resume looks cool, you know, trying out different technology, newer technologies, uh, cutting-edge technologies, you know, which probably don't make sense in the system or um, um, writing libraries where they could have reused an existing one. But uh, there might be like a slight difference in how the library or the framework works and what they want to do. It's very slight difference and they could have probably worked around it. But uh, because the incentive is in um, designing a new library, that's what uh, makes the resume shine. Um, they would build a new library or framework and release it and release it in open source uh, this happens uh, it's uh, commonly called uh, resume driven development and uh, this highlight actually demonstrates that it it, uh, it it portrays that that when organization provides no pathway to promotion for software engineers uh, they are incentivized to Take, make technical decisions that way, you know, to, to make the systems complex rather than keep them simple. Rather than integrating into the current system, they would go go the more difficult route simply because that's what, uh, that's where the incentives lie. And um, I think that's pretty much it. I did think of one more thing to say over here, but I'm kind of missing that now. I did cover resume driven development. Yeah, so it's all coming back to incentives, right? Uh, well, let's move on. Kill it with fire. Again, uh, what it's going to be kill it with fire today. Meetings, reports, and dialogues are the least efficient feedback loops. Feedback loops are most effective when the operator feels the impact rather than just hearing about it. That's because people are naturally inclined to misinterpret information to suit what they already want to believe. It is more difficult to do what... It's more difficult to do that when the feedback is delivered in the form of inconvenience, disruption, interruptions, and additional work. Um, again, it's not mentioned in this highlight, but the author is talking about uh, the on-call practice that's uh, and uh, uh, and also the DevOps practice. So uh, when 
the team that's handling the production work as in the the product work the product engineering when they are also involved in the infrastructure the incentives change uh, probably incentives are the wrong word but um, the priorities change whereas earlier there was a separate ops team that it had to worry about uh, you know software failing in production if uh, we remove that uh, gap if we remove that wall and you know adopt devops as a culture where uh, the team is responsible for uh, the ops as well for the infrastructure as well of course you know i've already discussed that uh, there might be infrastructure specialists on the team but yeah the team is responsible for infrastructure uh, in that case the team faces the pain and that's uh, that's a more effective feedback loop uh, you know because the team is directly inconvenienced by this they have to be on call they have to deal with it when when it's most inconvenient and that's when uh, they are more incentivized to um, to fix the software architecture if they are not being if, if they are not in the loop if the only way they receive feedback is through meetings or jira issues or broken tickets or bugs it's not that effective you know people have uh, they they can kind of like separate themselves from the whole notion of okay you know i need to go fix something let's move on get it done avoidance goals are particularly powerful in the context of preventing harm and escaping danger so uh, the author talks about two different types of goals avoidance goals and i think the other one was commitment goals uh, kind of like positive goals avoidance avoidance goals are things like um i should not gain weight something like that um so rather than uh, like you know i should not gain weight rather than that a better goal is to i should be fit because that portrays a positive image and that has its own set of benefits that has its own set of motivations but uh, avoidance goals uh, it, they generally should be avoided but except in cases where we are preventing harm and escaping danger uh, so for example um, Uh, the book had very nice examples over here i can't remember those uh, but uh, compliance for example uh, you know where uh, industrial safety you know with safety in a workplace for example uh, now if you want to maintain safety that goal can be framed as an avoidance goal that has higher motivations than you know a positive goal because we have to be safe it's kind of vague but uh, um uh, framing avoidance goals actually pro- provides that motivation on what uh, what needs to be done uh, the book had wonderful examples you know i can't remember that i think that would have made a lot of difference here but let's move on the molecule of more although we think of domination as an active even aggressive activity it doesn't have to be dopamine doesn't care how something is obtained it just wants to get what it wants so an agentic relationship can be entirely passive for example when a manager running an employee meeting gets the outcome he wants by keeping quiet uh, this particular section in the book you know the author is talking about how domin- uh, how dopamine likes control uh, there there are two different circuits you know there is like this pleasure circuit for dopamine where uh, the dopamine is uh, responds in uh, or or it's released in response to pleasure activities Uh, or control activities you know that's a control circuit of dopamine and uh, one easy way to portray control is domination but like the, in this particular highlight uh, this the, the author is making a point that dopamine's uh, the only thing it uh, cares about is getting what it wants it doesn't have to be aggressive uh, it doesn't even have to be an active activity like the highlight says Uh, and gives an example when a manager uh, running an employee meeting gets the outcome when he he wants by keeping quiet you know and um, uh, i mean like okay it sounds like manipulation maybe that's what the author implied over here and that's really about it you know um, we are motivated to uh, like in order to get what we want you know whatever tools are necessary we are motivated to get that and dopamine plays a role in that so uh, aggression or without aggression if there is manipulation if in other words if there is some sort of control through any means uh, that's that's uh, the dopamine uh, the dopaminic response you know that's our need for dopamine that uh, that drives the drives the control let's move on earned life i want i want the clients to see that when they trumpeted their roles as supportive leaders and in the same self contradictory breath asserted that they did not require equal support themselves they were in fact demeaning their employees and the dignity of their needs and this didn't go unnoticed by the employees it was a massive failure in leadership 
okay it's a little i think it's not that straightforward the author is talking about um, um you know leaders leading by example so when when the leaders say that uh, when the leaders are encouraging their team to get support when they need are they actually showing that by example and i'm when i'm looking at myself you know i think there is a lot of room for improvement for myself in that area as well that uh, and you know in in um, uh so for example you know in the beginning of the highlight when the author says you know they trumpeted the roles as supportive leaders and they also said that they don't need support themselves so it's a self contradiction it's a contradiction right and um this in fact it results in demeaning the employees and employees notice this it, it is obviously demeaning that you know uh, because it shows to the employees or it shows to the team that um, the the leader thinks uh, the leader does not identify themselves uh, along with the team I, I, does that make sense yeah uh, uh, dignity of for example you know uh, the highlight does mention words like dignity of their needs so the the leader is saying that the employees need something the team needs something but that's not something that the leader themselves need i think i'm just repeating myself uh, it's pretty clear i, I suppose by now let's move on originals the greatest communicators of all time says communication expert nancy duart who has spent her career studying the shape of super presentation starts by establishing what is here is the status quo then they compare compare what to compare that to what could be making the gap as big as possible okay i think it's pretty straightforward you know when you're communicating start with where you are right now and then show where you want to be <coughs> and make sure that the gap is as big as possible moving on getting things done everything that might require action must be reviewed on a frequent enough basis to keep your mind from taking back the job of remembering and reminding um we have discussed this several times the system of uh, where you keep your action items where you keep your notes a uh, to do list essentially uh, that has to be reviewed uh, that has to be reliable and that is when the brain will let go of the task of remembering it it, it will trust that okay there is there is some place where i can always remember where you can always get back what uh, and when i say i am talking about brain i'm perso- personifying brain uh, but yeah uh, mind will take over the job of remembering if it feels that uh, okay the the place where all of these action items are kept it's not reliable so uh, what does reliable mean in this context it means that it is accessible and it is also reviewed frequently if it if it is not accessible or if it's not reviewed frequently mind is not going to let go of the tasks it will keep it will there will always be this uh, um uh, what's the word not baggage there will always be this thing sticking in your mind while you're trying to focus on something else going on the end life in creating a great life for yourself accept the fact that the long that long term achievement requires short term sacrifice but don't go overboard on delayed gratification stop to enjoy the journey Life is a perpetual marshmallow test but there's no medal in for accumulating the most uneaten marshmallows you might as well be hoarding regrets so i i guess i don't really need to talk about the marshmallow test where uh, you know uh, they did this experiment with children where they gave them one marshmallow said you can eat it right now or you can wait 15 minutes and when they come back they will get second marshmallow and uh, the author goes on kind of ex- extending that you know uh, when they when the Uh, researcher comes back second time they would say uh, i don't think so this happened by the way it's just like a hypothetical thought experiment uh, you know when the researcher comes back the third time uh, second time they would say okay you know i know you can eat two marshmallows now but I, if you wait another 20 minutes i'll give you three ma- the third marshmallow and so on you know uh, so delayed gratification can really get stretched and uh, that's what the author is making uh, saying over here you know uh, don't go overboard on delayed gratification Uh, stop to enjoy the journey there may be a time where um, where it's time to just eat the marshmallows uh, like the author says life is a perpetual marshmallow test <laughs> yeah so and there's no medal for uh, uh, accumulating the most uneaten marshmallows what's the point if at the end of the life again this is a point in the book i'm not saying this what's the point if the at the end, end of your life you're you've just left with uh, uneaten stale marshmallows so you might as well be holding regrets that's the point so this was a really powerful uh, insight from the book moving on so get so good they can't ignore you 
For a mission-driven project to succeed, it should be remarkable in two different ways. First, it must compel people who encounter it to remark about it to others. Second, it must be launched in a venue that supports such remarking. Okay, I pretty straightforward, right? You know, I don't feel like I need to add anything over here. Which means I think we are at the end of our highlights today. And uh, I think that, you know, <laughs> this 15 minutes is mark is a new normal. Anyway, that's uh, that's today's video. Thank you for watching. Have a good uh, day. And uh, oh yeah, tomorrow is Friday, right? So I'll leave the weekend uh, wishes for tomorrow. Take care.